Hello, everyone. I'm David Thomason. I'm the Worldwide Director of Solution Architects at No Name Security, and uh, very excited to be here and to present uh, this presentation to you uh, regarding API discovery. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time going through uh, our platform or going through some slides, uh, and then if there is time uh, at the end of this, uh, I would love to show you just a little bit of our platform and some of the information that we uh, are able to expose for security teams. Uh, so uh, without further ado, let me, uh, let me just get some slides going here. So if you heard my earlier talk, I'm, I'm just gonna run over this uh, very quickly. Uh, I don't think this audience needs much introduction into why APIs are mission critical. Uh, obviously, this, uh, this is a group that is very well um, uh, versed in the use of APIs. You wouldn't be here uh, if you weren't. Uh, but APIs have obviously become a very big deal. Uh, and API security has become uh, an extremely big deal just over the last uh, couple of years. And so now we're seeing uh, additional stress put on security teams as APIs are being rolled out. We see that there's uh, conflict between security teams and the development teams. And this conflict isn't healthy within the organization. We need to figure out how to fix this. Now, I come from the security side and most of you probably come from the development side. And I want to encourage you, please um, challenge me with your questions during this, this presentation. Uh, I come from the security side and you know I'm used to being that guy that says, no, we can't do this. It's not secure enough. Uh, we're, it's, it's, the risk is too high. Uh, we also, uh, you know, if, if we do this, we're going to get hacked. And if we get hacked, we're going to look bad. It's going to hurt our reputation. It's going to cost us millions of dollars. All of those things I've heard and the fear factor that gets put into all of those things. And to be honest with you, I really want to see that challenge go away. I really want to see security teams and development teams working together to produce the best product that we can put out there in the shortest amount of time that meets the business needs, that meets the velocity challenges that business uh, units are faced with, uh, but also that meets the security needs uh, of the security team. We shouldn't have to have this conflict over and over and over again. So I, I, I challenge you to please help me out. Help me to see things the way that developers see them. Uh, help me to understand what you're thinking uh, as we're talking about APIs and API security. Um, you know, one of the things that, that always comes up is this uh, notion of shift left. And, and I love shift left. I think it's a, a, great, uh, a great thing for organizations to invest in. The more you can build security into your platforms early on, uh, into your products early on, whether it's you know, even designing the security before it goes to development. Uh, those are all great things. Testing before it goes into production, obviously a, a key element of the uh, shift left movement. Uh, making sure that best practices are followed when you're deploying in your API gateways or through your web application firewalls. Clearly those things add uh, a level of security to your deployment that is that is important. And, and we totally support all of that. Where, where I think the breakdown comes is that there is so much in even just the language that's spoken, that's the way it's different from uh, developers to the security team. In the security team, we talk about packets, we talk about malware, we talk about the protocols, we talk about all of the, uh, all of the security related stuff. We've got a gazillion acronyms uh, to teach uh, folks that are not security conscious. Uh, I heard a great uh, speaker earlier today talking about some of the acronyms and how silly they are because we've got two different acronyms that say exactly the same thing. Um, and, and, and there's a lot more than one case of that, unfortunately. So it, it's one of those things where we, we want to build this bridge uh, as a company here at No Name. We want to build the bridge between uh, the developers and 
uh, and the security team. We don't want to see this continued friction and conflict that we see today. Uh, we want to attack this problem together because if we're not working at it together, uh, we're never going to even come close to building a complete and mature uh, security capability uh, around our APIs. It can't be completely shift left. Shift left will only get us so far. We still have to protect right. And I think when both when when the when the security team understands the value that shift left brings, and when the and when the development team understands the the value that the uh, shield right or protect right brings, then all of a sudden we'll bridge that gap between those organizations. We'll build a uh, uh, an API security program that makes sense and that does that is very effective uh, at protecting our our security estate or our API security estate, if you will. So um, let me uh, let me move on uh, back to you know the original uh, you know premise here in that we want to build this bridge between the development and the security team. And I'm here talking to you from the security team, and I'm saying this is what I see. I see Experian. I see. LinkedIn, I see Peloton and YouTube and John Deere, all of these folks uh, are either hacked or researchers have found significant holes in their API infrastructure. And you can bet that the vast majority of these organizations have a shift left process. So we know that mistakes get made. We know that testing can't be 100% complete. There's always edge cases that, that can't happen. We want to recognize that. We, we know that that is the case, but we also know that the speed and the velocity at which uh, developers have to push this code out in order to uh, meet the demands of their customers and of their, of their business unit uh, is, is increasing as well. And as a result, you need to be faster. You need to do it better. But at the same time, we want to help protect you uh, on the back end that we don't become uh, uh, the victim of, of one of these kinds of issues that, that we've seen so often in, like I said, in Peloton and Experian and, and, and now LinkedIn and, and all of those. Uh, the problem is real, Gartner recognizes it, um, and so we'll move on. Now, uh, No Name Security developed this API security strategy we call DART, discover, analyze, remediate, and test. And really what I wanna spend time talking about today uh, is just the discover side of this. Uh, the discovery part of it is is so important. And and for all of you out there that are that are developers that understand this environment, uh, you understand that that there are uh, time constraints and that there are delivery requirements, uh, that there are production requirements, all of those kinds of things that have to be done. And oftentimes uh, we see that uh, you know. We have, to, we have to make compromises. How are we gonna get this done in a fast enough way? It's such that it can all be delivered and be secure enough, right? And up till today, it was kind of, you know, we'll, we'll test it. Maybe we found a vulnerability or two, but that's okay. We're gonna go ahead and, and deploy it. And then the security team will figure it out later, you know? And uh, this isn't throwing anybody under the bus. Because the security team in the past hasn't had the utilities, hasn't had the tools that they needed to be able to find those APIs. Should it be the responsibility of the development team to create some sort of uh, catalog or at this point an encyclopedia with all of the APIs that, that are in the organization and every time they're changed, they should update them. And, and every time there's a data type that, that, that mutates that they should update the the security team, and th th that would be an, uh, an almost impossible task just to cover those kinds of things uh, all by themselves and to make sure that the security team was aware and had visibility into those APIs to see that they were deployed in the same way that they were designed, that they were documented in the same way that they were deployed, all of those kinds of things, because it's very, very difficult for the security team to protect what they can't see. And again, this is, this is a visibility problem. And, and as I'm talking to you as developers, as I'm talking to you as the, 
uh, the folks who are responsible for building and, and deploying these APIs, I'm gonna ask you to push your security team to get tools like what we're going to present here in, over the next few minutes uh, to be able to discover all of the APIs uh, in your environment, to be able to see them even if they don't have access to the catalog, even if they don't have access to uh, all of the development tools and the GitHub and, and all of the different places where you're documenting the work that you're doing, the very important work that you're doing uh, associated with APIs. We're not gonna spend a lot of time in this, in this talk talking about the analysis, remediate and test. Uh, those are all very important to any API security strategy. I'm really gonna try and focus on, on the discover uh, piece of this. And please, I, I wanna take breaks uh, on, a, on a regular basis. Um, I've already talked for 10 minutes and haven't taken a break. So let me stop for just a minute and, and ask you, what, what do you wanna hear with, a, with regards to discovery uh, of APIs within your environment. What do you want to, uh, what do you want to see in terms of being able to discover uh, those APIs and the information that they're in and the, really everything about the, what we call the API estate, uh, which is not only the APIs themselves, but the, the configuration of everything that, that manages APIs. So, I'll, if you would, put your questions uh, in the chat uh, or in the Q&A uh, session here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to, I've already loaded my, um, uh, I've already loaded my uh, contact information into the chat. So if you want to reach out to me via email uh, or via my uh, LinkedIn profile, you'll, you'll have that information there. Uh, would love to talk with you. So um, again, we're going to talk about discovery. We're going to focus on the discovery of, of API, uh, APIs in any environment. So let's uh, get me back on the right screen here. And there we go. So we know this. Um, companies don't have complete visibility of their APIs. And I talk to CIOs and CISOs uh, every day. And when I talk to them, if it's a first call with them, I'll frequently ask them, how many APIs do you have? And the most honest answer I always get is, I don't know. They shrug. They give me a, I don't know. I don't have any idea how many APIs we have uh, in our environment. Uh, and it's like, well, how many APIs are you consuming from other organizations? In? Yeah, we, I don't know that too. I know we've got, you know, external uh, API communications with Slack and Jira, and we've got it with, uh, Salesforce, and we've got, you know, and they'll name off a handful of different applications that they use externally that they've integrated APIs with, uh, but they really, really don't have any visibility from a security perspective. And the challenge of this is, how do they get that information? Do you, you don't want to give them access to your GitHub. I don't want them to have access to your GitHub. I don't want, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we don't want, uh, we, and, and even that would probably be inadequate because if we think about it, APIs have been around for decades. In the 1980s, when I was in Air Force Intelligence, I, I was writing APIs uh, in, the, in the, well, I actually should say in the early 90s, uh, we were writing APIs to connect different programs uh, back then. It wasn't the same today. It wasn't SOAP and it wasn't REST, but it was connector code. I think oftentimes we called it something like middleware. Uh, that would that would connect to an application to a front end or a database to a front end, uh, and it was really an API uh, in its own right. Today, those uh, and and for decades, uh, for over a decade, we've had APIs, and we didn't have API gateways. Uh, web application firewalls were focused on the complete application and not each of the individual APIs that were used to operate in that API, and they worked very good. And we'll talk more. We could talk, I actually have a presentation tomorrow about why web application firewalls aren't enough. Um, they do a great job of, of some things and they, and they do some things very well. I would never advocate that you uh, uh, completely abandon the capabilities that you get through your web application firewall. And I said that very carefully because there may be other platforms that'll give you some of the same uh, protection that a web application firewall will give you, but I would not abandon all of that. Um, but the visibility of APIs is really, 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 really where the challenge is. Uh, we find a lot of organizations that tell us, if we could just get a handle on what APIs we have, 
then we would be able to scope our problem and essentially build a security program around what we have. But we don't know and we can't see and we don't know how to get that information. It's not real easy. And often what we find is that over 30% of the APIs are completely unmanaged or even unknown. Uh, and again, this is some of those legacy APIs that were around before there were API gateways or API management systems or, uh, or even uh, web application firewalls. And then most organizations have APIs that are dormant uh, or what we call rogue APIs, APIs that have been set up without the use of an API gateway. And maybe they were considered to be only internal or maybe for whatever reason, performance issues, whatever they thought, man, I really don't wanna go through an API gateway. I need to have direct access. Not a great idea, not a great idea. We always recommend that APIs be pushed through an API gateway. Uh, if they're internal to internal and you know that you know that you know, and I'll, I'm gonna put a big asterisk next to this because we have had lots of customers that told us, hey, that API is internal only. And what we found out was that the EC2 instance it sits on also has a public IP that is routed out through a load balancer that they didn't know about. And as a result, there's another route to get to that API that doesn't go through the API gateway. And say, ah, you know, and, and that, that leads to, of course, uh, significant issues, uh, the potential for an increased t attack surface. So want to talk to you about how, um, uh, how to get the visibility of these APIs. And existing solutions just aren't adequate. Uh, again, from a security perspective, we look at web application firewalls and they only see, and I'm gonna cut to just a couple of the big points on the web application firewalls, but a couple of them are, they're in line. They typically are placed in line, so they're only going to see the traffic that goes through them, which means that if the API isn't going through the, the web application firewall, it can't, in any way protect that API. It's not gonna discover something that is internal only. It's not gonna discover something that maybe is set up between uh, uh, a private VPN between you and a partner, but you don't know how secure that partner's uh, environment is. Uh, pen testing, let me, uh, let me just move through a few of these. Pen testing, uh, I'm a big advocate of pen testing. I used to be a pen tester. I did a lot of pen testing and application security testing is, is equally important. But the, the rules have changed when you start talking about APIs. When you were doing pen testing, uh, and when I was doing pen testing, we would typically get a scope of work that said, I want you to attack this class C network or this range of IP addresses. Uh, and and then you knew that you had 65,535 TCP ports and 65,535 UDP ports. And there I go talking programmer or uh, uh, security guy again. We had a very limited number of ports that we had to go after and we could identify every service that was running on those ports. Unfortunately, the way that APIs are set up, you could have a thousand endpoints on a single IP address on a single port if it's configured that way. I don't recommend that. That wouldn't be very wise. However, the number of endpoints is 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 unlimited. It's it's an infinite of what it could be uh, if it was limited to uh, IP addresses and port numbers. So the effectiveness of any kind of pen testing or bug bounty solution is going to depend on how many of the APIs they can actually find. And so one of the things that you wanna be doing when you're discovering APIs in your environment is be sharing that catalog with the pen testers, share it with the application security team. Now, I wouldn't recommend sharing it out to a whole bunch of the bug bounty guys, uh, but for your internal teams, for your internal security teams, or even your independent third party teams that you contract and you know exactly who is doing it, I would recommend sharing that data with them. Uh, with bug bounties, it's, it's, it's a different story. Um, and so I would, I would be careful uh, about what you share for a scope with them. But I, uh, not that they're not trustworthy because they vet all of their uh, testers, but uh, I just, I'm, I'm a leery of that because that's getting a pretty broad scope. Uh, giving a broad, broad scope to, uh, to somebody who, uh, who could potentially, uh, use that information, uh, in a not good way. So, uh, APIs are difficult to manage. You know, 
uh, I sympathize with the folks who have to deal with the policies and all those kinds of things associated with APIs. There are a million configuration options, it seems like, that need to be set for every single API. How it's going to flow, how, how it gets received, how it's sent, uh, what, what the limits are on particular data elements, and all of those kinds of things. All of the different configuration items uh, that go into this. And, and I was literally sat through a, uh, a session this morning where we were setting up uh, the, some abilities on, on Apogee. It happened to be this, the same platform that, that we're using as a demo here. And the number of different options that we had, it is no wonder to me why, and, and I really, really sympathize with the DevOps guys that mistakes can get made. It's so simple to miss a checkbox, to uh, to copy code to the wrong place, or to misspell a name, and all of a sudden that that particular piece of code doesn't work well anymore, or doesn't work at all. Uh, they're very, very difficult to configure and manage and maintain, and, and all those kinds of things. So I have uh, I have a, a real um, uh, I, I empathize with those that that are responsible for the management uh, of APIs. Um, and again, please, if you have any questions, uh, stick them in the, uh, uh, in the Q&A. I would love to answer the questions for you. Um, getting back on topic though, what, I, what we really wanna do is we wanna make this so much easier for the developers. We want to increase the communication between the security team as well as the development team. And, and again, we were talking about WAFs a minute ago. Um, so many of the security solutions, you know, that are out there have a bad reputation. And I heard Alyssa say it, Alyssa Knight, who was uh, emceeing the security uh, track uh, today, she said, yeah, security guys are some of the most egotistical people on the planet, and I can't argue with her. Um, we have a bad reputation for that, and we think our security programs are the best that there is, and we're going to be able to see and break, you know, and block and and break into things. And 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 at the end of the day, what's it doing? It's trying to make the programmers look bad. That's not what we want to do. That's not at all what we want to do. And so let me add a little bit of, um, let me add a little bit of uh, of context in here. You know. API security or any security program that sits in line uh, or requires agents or sensors or sidecars requires that the data pass through that device in order to be able to see it. So that's a big challenge. What about the, those things that don't have an inline capability? Or what about where you can't put an agent or a sensor or a sidecar, you can't afford the, uh, um, or where you can't afford the uh, the latency or the processing that it might uh, might require. Um, there's also limited integrations and deployment options. Uh, they introduce more complexity and risk to the environment. Uh, and and these are all challenges, especially when you're talking about APIs, because APIs make our business go, and we have to have them working very efficiently. That's why we have so many other tools that measure the latency and the effectiveness and the response time and the customer experience and all those kinds of things associated with APIs. And quite honestly, a lot of the API security platforms or any, uh, a lot of the different uh, security platforms out there are ineffective in general in finding malicious activity, fraught with false positives, all of those kinds of things. <clears throat> so, uh, we've got a question here from uh, Anonymous that says, exactly how do you discover APIs outside of our API gateway environment? Excellent question and, and leads right into, uh, into this slide. So what do we want to discover? Let's talk about that first. I want to discover all of the APIs. So outside of the API gateway environment, very good question. We have, for example, in, in this cloud environment, let me use that as the example to start off with, because with more organizations moving to the cloud and away from the physical data center, this is where we see most of the business and most of the APIs uh, being implemented these days. And organizations that have some sort of developed and mature security or even development process 
are utilizing API gateways, doing a lot of shift left and all those kinds of things, letting the API gateway take care of authentication. Outside of that, in this cloud environment, we want to utilize a number of different features uh, of the cloud environment itself in order to identify APIs. So for example, in an AWS environment, we're going to utilize the traffic mirroring capability. We're going to look at the different virtual machines or EC2 instances in this case. We're going to see if they have the right kind of ENI or elastic network interface. And we're going to monitor those network interfaces. We're going to mirror their traffic or clone their traffic so that we can see what's going on. Uh, we're also going to look at the load balancer or the firewall or uh, any of the other devices that make up the perimeter and see if there are APIs that are traversing the perimeter but aren't going through the API gateway. That's a real e easy exclusionary test uh, that we can do. So from our platform, uh, from our uh, uh, the way that NoName works, is we gather information from all of these different things in order to get the uh, all of the APIs, even if they're internal uh, to internal in this environment. Out in the data center, we're gonna connect to things like the F5, uh, or the Palo Alto firewall, they have a decrypted mirror port capability there. We might connect to a load balancer or to a, uh, or to an API, uh, physical API gateway in that environment as well. And again, this is a process or, uh, of mirroring the traffic. Sometimes they have something like, uh, Gigamon or, uh, Ixia or Anui, uh, devices installed in their environment so that we can monitor the traffic that come from those. But any, any way we can get a hold of that unencrypted uh, or decrypted API traffic, and you're going to say, but wait a minute, you know, we use SSL, and of course we want to run all of our APIs through HTTPS. What about that? Well, typically the API gateway and the load balancer are a good position to do the SSL termination. And from a security perspective, that just means, and, and from a development perspective, this is where the decryption occurs. We then get the information from the decrypted platform, from the decrypted side of the communications. That way we can see everything about the APIs. And if we look back over to the left-hand side of my slide here, what can we see? Well, we can see all of the data types, not just the sensitive data types, but all of the data types. So if there's PCI or PHI in there, we'll know about it. If it's routed, how that how that device is routing that information. If we're discovering all of the information about this environment, uh, by looking at the configuration of these devices, we can see that there's an API that's routed between these two EC2 instances, for example. Uh, and we can also see that that particular API may now be exposed because somebody installed a load balancer and that load balancer now has exposed this, e this API that's uh, uh, created by the, or that, that's indicated by the dotted lines has now exposed that API through the load balancer out to the, uh, uh, out to the internet without going through the API gateway. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's one, um, that's just another, uh, example of how, uh, we discover all of the information about the APIs, not just the APIs themselves. So the, the routed information, uh, the associated resource where the API is coming from. Obviously, if we see it at the load balancer and it's coming from this EC2 instance, we can identify that EC2 instance, the server name, the application, all of those kinds of things. Uh, from that, we can often derive, or if it's often in the metadata of the API, which app or business unit it belongs to. And by identifying who has that API, we can then redirect any issues or remediation that is necessary associated with that API back to the, back to the right group. And I see I've got another question here. It says, you talked about WAFs earlier. Uh, our WAF can detect SQL and command injections, great, and a lot more web app related uh, issues probably some API related issues as well. How are you different from a WAF? That's a, a, a great question. Um, I, would, I would ask you a question and if, if you can get it into the, into the Q&A, if you can answer it there, that'd be awesome. Um, the, uh, uh, does your WAF sit in line? Uh, is it sitting uh, in line and is it actually blocking anything would be the first question because about a large percentage of the WAFs that are deployed uh, I think all of them are deployed in line for the most part. And from there, they, uh, 
but only a small percentage of them actually block uh, any traffic. Uh, they, they worry about the false positives and those kinds of things blocking uh, legitimate traffic. And so there's some issues associated with WAFs there. Having said that, the WAF is only going to see the parts of the environment that it's connected to. So if it's connected between, for example, between the firewall and the web servers uh, back here, it's only going to see this link. It's not going to see these other links. And in the same way, if it sits behind the API or between the API gateways uh, or out in front of the API gateways, it's only going to see the traffic that goes that direction. It's not going to see the internal to internal traffic that isn't routed be, uh, through the WAF. Uh, the other thing is application, web application firewalls uh, do exactly what they say. They're a firewall for an application. And so they oftentimes are looking at the parameters of that application. What port number do they run on? Um, what, uh, what's the front end of that application look like? And they do typically do a very good job of, de of detecting SQL, uh, SQL injections, command injections, cross-site scripting, uh, a lot of those different kinds of uh, application uh, vulnerabilities. What they typically don't understand is the behavior of the APIs. So there are very few WAFs out there, for example, that will detect a broken object level authorization uh, attack. Uh, if there's a WAF out there that does that uh, consistently and regularly, uh, I'm, 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 I'll be proven wrong. Uh, what we do, though, and how we are different uh, is that we look at the entire environment, not just the traffic that's flowing through them like a WAF does. We also look at the configuration of the WAF and of the API gateway and of the load balancer and of the, of the instances that, that are uh, uh, operating the, uh, the APIs. And so as a result, we can see those configuration mistakes even before there's traffic that would indicate that there's a SQL injection. So we can tell you, for example, that the API gateway doesn't have the rate limiting policy applied to it like it should, or that the load balancer doesn't have that same rate limiting capability uh, deployed. So you're susceptible to a denial of service attack. We'll tell you about all of those things and then integrate with your existing infrastructure such that you can see uh, or such that you can remediate it with, with very little uh, uh, human effort. So. That's how we differ from them. We are, uh, we, we see a lot more because we're, we're attached to more parts uh, of the network. Uh, and we identify more specifically what's going on within the specific behavior of the APIs in your environment. So, um, getting down to the bottom, uh, because we see all of the sensitive data types or all of the data types, you can identify what are sensitive data types. We have standard data types that we identify, but then you can go in and tag those specific data types with one or more tags, with any number of tags, and that way you can then run reports to find out, okay, am I PCI compliant? Am I P PHI compliant? Is my PII data staying internal or is it going out? And if it's going out, is it going out in chunks or is it going out little by little? You can then have the ability to see where that data is being transmitted, how it's being used, what applications are consuming that data, uh, what IP addresses are getting it, all of those kinds of things, and in what volume, all of those are, are very, very visible by watching everything that's going on in this environment. So great questions, thank you, keep them coming. Uh, I got a couple more slides and then we'll, um, actually no, I don't have another slide. I'm gonna jump into uh, our UI actually. And so I wanna share with you uh, some more information about, you know, what we do, how we, you know, what, what is the information that, that we identify? Now, this is our demo environment. And in this demo environment, we have discovered 529 APIs. Now, this whole presentation was about discovery. And so one of the things that you can find very, very quickly uh, within the discovery is, you know, where are our APIs uh, in our environment? And let me click on the uh, actual UI and not on the uh, um, not in the demonstration screen here. And so now uh, within this, you can see every subdomain uh, that we have identified APIs on. So obviously there's a lot of different subdomains in here. On any given one of these, we might pick a, a domain and find that there's 15 APIs uh, in the Griffin domain. Uh, in the prod domain, we've got 90 APIs. 
in the sandbox, we've got 249 APIs. And we can see all of these APIs. In fact, as we look at these APIs, we can see how they're authenticated. By the way, we identify or, or uh, enumerate an API as a domain, a method, and a URI. So this would be one API. If no touch shows up again down here somewhere later, and it's not a get, uh, it's a push or a put, uh, it then is a separate API because it has a different function. Uh, we'll tell you how that API is authenticated. Is it authenticated with a header or a cookie? Is there no uh, authentication associated with it? If it's internet facing, how is it internet facing? Do we see it via HTTP or HTTPS or both? Uh, where we're getting the data uh, for that particular um, API, if there's any data types in the request, it looks like all of these are, well, there's one that's got an email uh, that's in the data type. And then what kind of data types are in the response? In this case, we've got, for example, email, uh, username, first name, last name, and telephone number, right? How many users are using the API? What the endpoint is in the environment? Where, which load balancer did it go through? And which API gateway service did we get it from? So we see all of these different uh, integrations. We see all of these different uh, elements of every single API within the environment. And uh, I, I would love to see some questions come because I'm, I'm gonna wrap up here in just a minute. Would love to tell you more about what we do. Um, in this particular environment, let's just grab one of these APIs and, and talk a little bit about more about the detail. And again, here's the API at the top of the screen. Uh, we got it from an Apogee uh, resource um, uh, within the environment. In this particular case, we can see, if I expand uh, everything here, um, if we expand this, we can see in the header uh, how this API is uh, authenticated. In the bottom, we can see that the query is a username and a password. Uh, if we go back to the response, we can see that the response it is also uh, contains an email, the full name, uh, date of birth, user ID, social security number, and a username string. So all of this information is exposed uh, by the discovery process of getting all this information uh, from, uh, from the areas where we are collecting data inside of either the cloud or even the physical data center. Uh, I've got another question here that says, how do you determine uh, the specific data type of a field in the API, and how do you detect something that is PCI, for example? Ah, great question. So we already have uh, data types predefined uh, in our environment. Uh, let me click on this. Um, so in this, uh, in this example, for example, we provide the customer with a list of data types, and we identify these based on uh, the value and the format of the data. Oftentimes it's really simple. There's a label that says password and then it has a text uh, string after it. We know that that's a password and should be sensitive, right? Um, others are less, uh, um, uh, less visible, less easy. Sometimes it's a, a card number or a credit card number or CCN. Uh, we have a set of rules that will automatically define uh, those particular data types. And then the customer has the ability to go in and, to, and change whether or not they're sensitive. We assume that some things that we know based on compliance requirements are going to be sensitive. And then the customer also has the option to create their own tags. So in this particular case, we've got PCI or PII. Uh, you could create your own tag if you were um, a, uh, a car manufacturer and you wanted to track VIN numbers. Uh, and that was sensitive data and from one of your apps, you could add VIN number and use a regex to describe it, add it to the data types, and now we would identify that particular uh, data type. And if you put a tag on it that says it's PCI, that's gonna be identified as PCI. So the customer has the flexibility to make sure that whatever the sensitive data types are, are appropriately tagged with, uh, with the right tags, whether it's, uh, uh, PCI, PII, PHI, uh, any of the, uh, you know, international standards, uh, GDPR, any of those, uh, you can add those tags as well. Uh, so completely um, configurable. Um, going back to our discovery and, and the APIs, again, 
uh, we want to discover everything in the environment. So we discover all of the APIs. We also discover all of the devices, as I mentioned before, uh, the load balancers, the API gateways, uh, even the EC2 instances that are handling APIs. And from there, we want to, uh, we want to be able to see all of the information associated with those as all of those things impact uh, the security of those APIs. So if you're a developer, uh, one of the things that, that you have the advantage of is that you have access to your API spec or your Swagger UI. And you can see every single API that you guys have cataloged uh, through the Swagger spec. The security team, on the other hand, doesn't often have that information. Now, if you guys will, uh, you don't, well, you don't have to do anything now. If the security team deploys uh, our platform, they can see your APIs as they've been deployed. They can then create their own Swagger spec just by clicking on the Swagger UI up here, and it will automatically build uh, this table, and they can see all of the information associated with that particular API. Um, and I gotta get back on my screen here, there we go. And now they can see all of the information associated with the API, and they can then go about doing their pen testing, their application security testing against those APIs to make sure that they're as secure as possible. And it's back on the security team now because they have this information to be able to utilize it in a way that makes sense and reduces the attack surface uh, for your organization. And this takes, again, a load off of the development team, at least until such time as they discover a vulnerability and need your help to fix it. Because let's face it, at the end of the day, the security team doesn't know how to fix APIs. They need your help for that. Can they? So they can do it as a Swagger file. They can also download uh, the entire uh, the entire uh, group of APIs uh, with a, as a zip file, and they can see everything that way and hand that off as again a scope of work to the application security team uh, in the environment. So that really wraps up my uh, my talk about discovery. We've got a few minutes left and uh, really about five, I think. And so if there's any more questions, I would love to answer your questions. Uh, we also have a booth. Uh, I would highly recommend that if you have any questions to go visit our booth, go talk to Andre over there. And uh, uh, he and Rich would love to talk to you about uh, our platform and how we can help organizations to discover all their APIs, but also to analyze those uh, remediate and test them. So, and by the way, I do have another presentation tomorrow that's all about uh, one of the topics that a question was asked about here. The whole topic is on web application firewalls and why they are not enough. Um, and so if you uh, wanna hear a lot more about that, I'll be doing that presentation tomorrow. And it's on the agenda, I apologize. I don't have the time right here in front of me, or do I? Yes, it's at 11.10. Uh, uh, Eastern time tomorrow. Why a web application firewall isn't enough tomorrow at 11.10. So look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, I'll hang out for a few minutes to see if there's any more questions and uh, have a great day.